Good evening, everyone. We're going to get started. So if you have not signed in, please sign in at the back table. And if you would like to speak, there are speaker slips also on the back table. Uh, my name is Tanya Cantlow, and I'm the acting counsel to Brooklyn Borough President Eric L. Adams, and I'd like to welcome you to Borough Hall. To my left, I have Richard Barrick, who is our land use director, and to my right, I have Ina Gusenfeld, who is the land use coordinator. Please note that this hearing is being recorded to comply with the public law for transparency. There are seven items on the agenda this evening. It will be available for viewing on Borough President Adams' website, brooklyn-usa.org, or on the One Brooklyn channel on YouTube. Again, web viewers may submit timely comments to ask Eric at brooklynbp.nyc.gov for Borough President Adams' consideration. Please call the first item and let us begin. Calendar item number 1190452PCK. This application submitted by the Departments of Parks and Recreation and Citywide Administrative Services pursuant to Section 197-C of the New York City Charter for the site selection and acquisition of a property located at 151 Fountain Avenue. Such action would facilitate the expansion of the Green Gems Garden and existing community garden, which abuts the proposed acquisition site. Community Board 5 is still considering this matter. Borough President Adams will hold off on making any, any decisions until he hears from the board. Would Michael Pordiguez short? Hi. The representative for this application, please state your name for the record and present the application. Uh, thank you. Good evening. My name is Michael Portuguese Swart. I'm a project planner with the Department of Parks and Recreation. Uh, Parks with co applicant uh, Department of Citywide Administrative Services is seeking to site select and acquire a property located at 151 Fountain Avenue in Community Board 5. The requested action would allow Parks and DCAS to acquire the subject property to facilitate the expansion of the Green Gems Community Garden, which occupies 13 lots. Uh, the site can be seen here, outlined in red, is, 2000, is part of a 2,500 square foot. Um, it is a 2,500 square foot lot um, located on the east side of Fountain Avenue, mid block between Glenmore Avenue and Liberty Avenue. The current garden consists of 13 city owned lots, uh, which were assigned to parks for garden purposes in 2002, and one of which was assigned later in 2005, similarly for garden purposes. Collectively, these are known as the Green Gems Community Garden. Uh, here you can see the tax lots. Uh, the garden is currently licensed through the Green Thumb Program. Uh, license requirements include keeping the garden open to the public at least 20 hours per week, allowing neighborhood residents to join the community garden on a first come, first serve basis. Uh, they also require them to post information and signage on the fence. The garden has been a positive community resource, providing community management, community managed passive open space for area residents and a setting for environmental education. Uh, these are some images of the garden. Uh, the lot in question is actually uh, outlined by the uh, wooden and fences. The garden grows fruits and vegetables in 24 raised planter beds. There are 15 fruit trees on the site. The garden has 24 chickens, four rabbits. Mm. The garden also uses the animals in horticulture as part of their educational programs. Uh, this coming fall, the gardeners, in collaboration with Green Thumb, are running a winter chicken care workshop. Uh, here you can see more of the, of the chickens and the planter beds. Um, of the 24 planter beds, six are being used by a local high school. Um, Councilmember Espinal has acknowledged the importance of preserving the entire garden and has allocated funds towards the acquisition of the private property. Here you can see a proposed timeline uh, for the ULERT process. Uh, 
assuming everything goes well, we're looking to um, have DCAS negotiate closing in late spring of 2020. Uh, in conclusion, the Parks Department and DCAS are seeking um, for the support of this action to facilitate the acquisition and preservation of this privately owned lot so that it may be formally included as part of the larger community garden. Thank you. Any questions? Actually, yes, I have one question. What improvements are required to combine the lot with the existing community garden? For example, perimeter fencing, and does the garden have a direct water source? Uh, there is no fencing needed. Uh, right now, the fence, uh, there is no fencing. Um, it's kind of incorporated into the full garden and being um, taken care of by the gardeners right now. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as water, there is no water on site. Uh, they use uh, hydrant water um, from the city through permits from DP facilitated by Green Thumb. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any speakers? Okay. 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 Are there any speakers who have not submitted a speaker slip that would like to speak on this calendar item? Okay. If none, uh, Richard, could you please close this item, please? Calendar item number one is closed. Calendar item number two, one nine zero four zero eight ZRY. This application submitted by the New York City Department of City Planning for a zoning text amendment to update provisions of the New York City zoning resolution related to signage and amenities in privately owned public spaces, POPs. Such action would facilitate an update to the existing public school symbol require public space signage for various types of pops and permit publicly accessible movable tables and chairs to be placed in arcades and plazas where they are currently prohibited. Community boards one and two each voted to approve this application. Would Stella Kim, the representative for this application, please state your name for the record and present the application. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Stella Kim and I'm the Program Manager of Privately Owned Public Spaces, or POPs, at the Department of City Planning. Tonight I'm here to present a targeted text amendment related to signage and amenities in POPs. Um, first I'll begin with an overview of POPs before diving in. So POPs is an acronym for Privately Owned Public Spaces. They are a collection of indoor and outdoor spaces on private property in the densest areas of our city intended for public use. They're owned and maintained by property owners, primarily in exchange for bonus floor area or waivers, and or were otherwise required as part of special permits or districts. Today we have over 550 POPs at over 350 buildings across the city, which is equivalent to roughly nine Bryant Parks um, or half of Governor's Island. This incentive zoning tool was first introduced in the 1961 zoning resolution in the form of these plazas and arcades with minimal standards um, as shown um, in the photo here. But since 1961, um, the regulations governing POPs have evolved tremendously um, and there have been many text amendments introduced that introduced new types of spaces or phased out certain types and refined or designed standards over time. Um, one thing to note is that while the, the types of POPs really vary and each one is grandfathered under the regulations they were built under, so essentially each POPs in the city is, uh, has its own unique requirements. The department has continued to enhance these design standards for these public spaces to ensure that they are of high quality and useful and inviting to the public, with the uh, last major update to plaza standards being in 2007 and 2009. So one of the key elements in um, that update is related to signage, which is key to making sure that these spaces are known to the public. Signage became required at plazas beginning in 1975. When well done, they really help key in the public to know that these spaces that they pass by are public and they have a right to use and enjoy them. But when done poorly um, or absent, they have quite the opposite effect and sometimes are tied to enforcement challenges. Um, there are many spaces that were created um, to older standards um, or were under regulations that did not require signage. 
Um, but all of this changed in 2017 when the city adopted a local law that requires public space signage at all POPs. So um, spaces that were created since 2007 have been using um, this tree symbol that you see in some variations here on the screen. Um, and with this new requirement that, the, that all POPs need signage, um, it really opened up an opportunity for the department to look at um, the identity of POPs and to um, have like a fresh face. Um, so the department with uh, two of our longtime partners, Advocates for Privately Owned Public Spaces and the Municipal Arts Society of New York, we partnered in a design competition um, over the year where we received over 600 submissions um, and heard from the public about their favorite designs. And um, we have chosen this logo to be our new POPs logo. Um, the, this was chosen out of the three awardees that our panel chose from the competition. And we're incredibly excited about this new logo, but as you can see, it emphasizes the um, use of seating. And um, not all POPs technically are allowed to even have seating, so this is something we want to address and open up that potential for. Um, so um, that is one of the main items of the text amendment. Um, and the same goes for arcades as well. Arcades are not allowed to have any obstructions currently, so we want to unlock the potential for public seating to be um, in these uh, otherwise empty spaces. Uh, so to sum it up, the department's proposing this text amendment to essentially allow us to update the old logo and ensure that all POPs have the required signage and to allow um, otherwise barren plazas and arcades to be able to include public seating um, and amenities. The applicability of this text um, is that generally POPs Bonuses are available in medium to high density commercial districts and high density residential districts throughout the city. Um, they're also incorporated into the zoning text of various special zoning districts um, throughout Manhattan, Brooklyn, and Queens. Um, and that is it, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, so we have two questions for you. The first question for owners of existing POPs. What would be the process to voluntarily retrofit, retrofit those spaces should there be an interest in providing movable street furniture? So for the, the aspect of the text amendment is um, allowing owners to place tables and chairs for the public as of right. So there is no process that they'd have to go through. They could just do that as long as what they're doing meets um, the zoning text. Um, for any you know, major um, upgrade to a plaza, we do already have a process in place in our zoning, um, a chairperson certification for design changes. So that would be um, the process to do anything more than just placing tables and chairs in these spaces. And if you could, please share any considerations that would trigger compliance with the new rules. Sorry, could you repeat that? Please share any considerations that would trigger compliance trigger with the new compliance. rules. With the new rules. Um, this is allowing, um, so as I said, these older plazas that were built pursuant to older regulations, um, there's a specific type, the 1961 plazas we call them, built pursuant to the 1961 zoning that doesn't even allow these tables and chairs. So we are, and they're grandfathered under that. So we are just unlocking the ability to add them, to force them to have um, add these amenities is a stretch a bit too far given that they are grandfathered under prior regulations. Um, but if they were to choose to do a construction project within the plaza, mm -hmm. would that idea of doing construction trigger the compliance to these rules? It, it would trigger compliance to actually a lot more than that. It would trigger um, becoming what we call in greater accordance with their current regulations. So that, that approval process, again, would be that um, certification I just mentioned. It would require owners, I know a lot of the Brooklyn plazas, for example, are quite older. If an owner wanted to change the design of the plaza, they would, um, we would hold them to a standard of becoming 
um, as close as they can to our current standards as possible. Okay, thank you. Thank you. No speaker? Okay. Okay, is there anyone that would like to speak that has not submitted a speaker slip? Okay. Richard, if you could please close this calendar item. Calendar item number two is closed. Calendar item number three, 190394, PQK, 190395, PPK. This application submitted by the Departments of Housing, Preservation, and Development and Citywide Administrative Services pursuant to Section 197-C of the New York City Charter for the acquisition of the properties in the Seagate section of Community District 13 and in the Garrison Beach, Manhattan Beach, and Sheepshead Bay neighborhoods in Community District 15. Such action would facilitate the disposition of the resilient housing lots to private owners for redevelopment as flood compliant one and two family homes. Community boards 13 and 15 voted to approve this application. Would Deborah Morris, the representative for this application, please state your name for the record and present the application. Good evening, I'm Deborah Helene Morris, Executive Director of Resiliency Planning Policy and Acquisitions at New York City Housing Preservation and Development. Thank you so much for holding this hearing. I'm gonna walk briefly through um, the actions. Sorry, a little bit of a program background on storm recovery, the ULERP actions, and we'll take all of your questions. Um, so just as a quick point of reference, um, the actions we'll discuss today are related to the end of the Build It Back and Hurricane Sandy recovery here in the city of New York. Uh, the Build It Back program was primarily a program serving homeowners, one to four family owners, interested in repairing their homes. The vast majority of participants in the program um, took a reconstruction or repair benefit. What we're talking about today are homeowners who were offered a repair or reconstruction benefit of a substantially damaged home who instead elected to sell their homes to the program. Um, there are 13 properties in Brooklyn citywide. There are 141 lots. Uh, home acquisition um, from these participants in Build It Back were managed through a third-party subrecipient called Project Rebuild Inc. They are a nonprofit with a agreement with the city. Um, properties purchased through the program uh, can be used in one of two ways, in one or two ways. They are either um, limited to redevelopment as open space, um, which must stay open space in perpetuity or redevelopment as a new resilient home, which must be elevated in accordance with Appendix G in the New York City Building Code. Um, how the city determines whether or not um, which pathway these properties take um, is an evaluation of land use, um, connection to city infrastructure, including sewer and water access, um, presence of wetlands and coastal erosion, um, flood elevation, and existing neighborhood plans in coordination with the Department of City Planning. A buyout site, a open space site, which is on the top, uh, primarily is open space and adjacent to a waterway. A resilient housing site is surrounded by other homes. Uh, citywide, um, this is just showing you the distribution. Um, participation in Brooklyn was particularly low compared to Southeast Queens and Staten Island. Um, so here in Brooklyn, we have properties in board 15 um, and board 13. Sorry, that is a mistake in the presentation. Um, all of the sites are redevelopment sites, um, which redevelopment can take place in two ways. It can be developed through private auction and through a fair market sale um, or through a managed redevelopment program um, through an RFP issued by HPD. Um, in Manhattan Beach, uh, there is one site planned for managed redevelopment. In Sheepshead Bay, there are seven sites um, slated for private auction. And in Garrettson Beach, there are three sites for managed redevelopment. And in Seagate, there are two sites planned for private auction. And the main difference between private auction and managed redevelopment is managed redevelopment sites are planned for the development of affordable housing. Um, so managed redevelopment has a competitive selection process. Um, developers bid on clusters. Um, developers are creating middle income home ownership, um, one and two family homes, and we have design requirements. Um, managed redevelopment must be 
under our terms. Um, so properties are evaluated uh, based on their um, zoning, their size, and connection to infrastructure. Private auction sites sell to the highest bidder. Um, developers can bid on one or many sites. Um, there are no design controls. Um, here in Brooklyn, private auction sites are difficult to develop sites that lack street frontage, um, have high home ownership fees, um, or have size constraints. Um, managed redevelopment sites here on a map in Garrison Beach, 25 Abbey Court, 5 Beacon Court, 17 Noel Avenue, as well as 124 Oxford Street in Manhattan Beach. Um, this is just a little bit of background on our RFP, which we released um, in December, uh, is currently under review at the agency, um, and homes will be redeveloped through our open doors term sheet um, for middle income households, so 80 to 130 AMI, um, with a regulatory term of 20 to 40 years. Um, the resilient design guidelines are to encourage resilient and sustainable design um, and a sense of seaside context um, with significant design controls to maintain an active streetscape and provide street parking whenever possible. Um, for private auction lots, um, all of the sites in Sheepshead Bay, so 12 Lake Avenue, 19 Lake Avenue, 2 Lake Avenue, 18 Stanton Road, 23 Stanton Road, 25 Stanton Road, and 17 Weber's Court. Um, these are all known as Sheep's Bay, Sheepshead Bay Court communities, um, which do not have street access except for 19 Lake. Um, in Seagate, there are two properties planned for private auction, 3826 Cypress Avenue and 3749 Neptune Avenue. Um, the private auction process would be through a sealed bid auction where notices would go to adjacent neighbors as well as um, notices um, through community board civic organizations and newspapers. Um, limitations on land use. Resilient housing must be flood compliant and has a flood insurance requirement in perpetuity. Redevelopment is limited to one and two family homes um, unless it is combined with other prop adjacent properties and can be pursuant to zoning. Um, home ownership, home owners association requirements apply to all sites that um, are within homeowners associations. Um, and compliance is enforced through a deed. Um, HUD also requires um, redevelopment in a timely manner, which we are stating at the offset is 18 to 24 month. Um, failures to comply um, could be surrender to the city um, so that the site could be managed as a city asset or sold at fair market value. value. If um, the city does not enforce these provisions, um, the city may have to return federal funds to the government. So the ULERP actions today are so that the city can have the authority to take on the ownership of properties managed by our subrecipient Project Rebuild Inc. There are three ULERPs in Brooklyn, Queens, and Staten Island. Um, here in Brooklyn, we have a co-applicant of DCAS. Um, for all sites, we were requesting acquisition authority as well as disposition authority, um, and the outcome is 13 flood resilient homes. Um, We've had meetings here at the Brooklyn Borough President's Office with our council members, Deutsch and Meisel, um, and with community boards 13 and 15. Both community boards 13 and 15 voted to approve the ULERP with no conditions. Um, just in terms of a timeline, um, the ULERP certified on May 20th. Um, we are likely to have our city planning commission hearing um, in sometime between late August and mid-October. Um, and our council hearing later in the fall. Um, we also have an additional time clock, which is our contract with Project Rebuild Inc., um, which expires at the end of 2020. I can take your questions. Thank, Thank you. Thank you again, Ms. Morris. Um, regarding the requested affordable housing home, home ownership sites, what consideration would be given to requiring it, requiring that be, they be disposed with permanent affordable housing restrictions according to the shared equity model? Sure. Um, so through our RFP, for res the Resilient Housing RFP, um, we were open to, to um, proposals by um, community land trusts or any kind of shared housing model. We did not receive any proposals um, from that type of nonprofit or developer. Um, the plan is to do development pursuant to the open doors term sheet, um, which uses a tax exemption 
um, for 20 to 40 years to maintain affordability for the home. Okay, last question. Um, why weren't all of the resilient housing sites proposed for redevelopment as affordable housing, and how would HPD consider offering all sites as affordable home ownership uh, opportunities? Sure. Um, so a number of sites in the portfolio do not have street access, um, and some do not have direct sewer access. Um, those are two of the beginning uh, points of whether or not a site is appropriate for affordable housing development and whether that would be um, workable. Um, the second constraint is size, um, which some of the sites in this portfolio are exceedingly small and would require um, redevelopment with an adjacent site which is not in our portfolio. Um, for that reason, the vast majority of the sites, so those sites in um, Sheepshead Bay Courts, in particular, are simply not appropriate for affordable housing development. It's the construction is not cost reasonable, and it would cre create um, serious access issues. Um, for the sites in Seagate, um, where there is a homeowners association with significant fees, those fees present a barrier to affordability that we are not able to overcome because um, that that cost combined with the cost of a mortgage and flood insurance would exceed, would well exceed 30% of a household's income. Can I ask you regarding the HOA, are you able to state what the fees are? Sure, so the fees are based on proper, assessed property taxes. So properties that have um, an abatement, which affordable housing uh, would, um, they would still show an assessed value, and that assessed value and that assessed tax would be the homeowners association fee. And for the properties in Sega, the two properties, do we know what that might be? Well, it would be based on an assessment after the house is built. Um, so pre pre storm um, tax assessments ran between um, three to five thousand dollars a year. Um, these will be new homes, so they, they may have significantly higher assessed tax values. And on three to five thousand a year, what might a typical yearly or monthly payment be? Um, so you would uh, taxes are assessed quarterly, so you would divide that number by four. So the, so the homeowners association is the tax, the assessed value. So, so they are charging. So the Seagate Homeowners Association charges. Um, each homeowner um, the same value as their um, tax payment. So if their tax payment is $3,000 a year, the homeowners association fee is $3,000 a year. If the tax annual taxes are $5,000 a year, the homeowners association fee is $5,000 a year. So that household would pay $10,000 a year. 5000 to the city and 5000 to homeowners? Correct. Okay. Um, so I, the way the Seagate Homeowners Association explained it to us is the taxes are, the homeowners association fees are to sort of like account for the variety of size and value and level of services they provide um, within the association. Um, but for affordable housing, that's one, a significant challenge because it's an unpredictable cost. Um, and two, and it's, it's a significant cost. Um, it's not, you know, $100 a month or something, you're talking about a significant component of what someone would be paying on top of their, their mortgage and their flood insurance, which is also um, probably a, a few thousand dollars a year. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Morris. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone that would like to speak that has not submitted a speaker slip? Okay, hearing none. If Richard, if you could please close this item, please. Calendar item number three is closed. Calendar item number four, 190409 HAK, 190410 ZMK, 190414 ZRK, 190421 ZSK. These applications submitted by the Department of Housing, Preservation, and Development pursuant to sections 197-C and 201 of the New York City Charter for a series of actions affecting the block bounded by Blake Avenue, Hinsdale Street, Snedeker Avenue, and Sutter Avenue, 
including designating the existing HELP USA facility as an urban development action area and an urban development action area project for such area, disposition of city-owned land, a zoning map amendment to eliminate an AC 2-3 overlay from an existing R6 district, change R6 and C4-3 districts to R6A and R7D, and establish C1-4 and C2-4 overlays along the Blake and Sutter frontages, a zoning text amendment to designate a mandatory inclusionary housing area for the project area, and a grant of a large-scale general developmental special permit to redistribute floor area across the development site in a more contextually appropriate manner. Such actions would facilitate the construction of four new buildings containing approximately 195 homeless shelter units and 324 affordable and supportive housing units, as well as commercial and community facility space in Brooklyn Community District 5. Community Board 5 is considering this matter. Borough President Adams will hold off on making any decision until he hears from the board. Would Aaron Buchanan, the representative for this application, please state your name for the record and present the application. Good evening. My name is Aaron Buchanan and I'm from the New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development. With me tonight are members of the development team working on the 515 Blake Avenue project, including representatives from Help USA and Curtis and Ginsburg Architects. Uh, the project at 515 Blake Avenue proposes to redevelop an existing homeless shelter into three new affordable housing buildings, a new homeless shelter, and retail spaces. The ULERP application for this project was certified on May 20th, and HPD is the applicant. Help USA is the sponsor responsible for the redevelopment of this project, and this ULERP application is seeking approvals for urban development action area project designation and project approval, and the disposition of city-owned property, a zoning map amendment to rezone the development site from C43 R6 and R6 C23 to R7D C24, R6A and R7D with a C14 commercial overlay. Also a zoning text amendment to designate the development site as a mandatory inclusionary housing area and a large scale, a large -scale general development special permit pursuant to the zoning resolution section 74743. So I'll provide a very brief overview of the proposed project before handing it over to the team to go into all of the details. So the project uh, will be located on one city-owned vacant tax lot that's between Blake Avenue, Snedeker Avenue, Sutter Avenue, and Hinsdale Street. The project proposes the redevelopment of the existing homeless shelter into four buildings that range from six to 10 stories. The proposed project will contain approximately 326 units and supportive, affordable and supportive housing units plus the 195-unit new shelter. And amenities in the buildings will include supportive service space, retail space, bike storage, laundry rooms, community rooms, and a landscaped rear courtyard. Uh, now I'll hand it over to Tom, who will provide an overview of help, their work in the area, the existing shelter, and then the project details. Good evening, I'm Tom Hameline, president of Help USA, not-for-profit organization that specializes in uh, serving homeless and low-income families and adults through both services and, and housing. Um, we started working in East New York in 1987 and opened the Help One Shelter on this block at 515 Blake Avenue. <clears throat> that building has now seen um, roughly 33, 34 years of service and uh, is badly in need of uh, replacement. The um, HELP is uh, also very active uh, elsewhere in the immediate community, and uh, we provide uh, um, low-income housing at three additional sites. Um, we also have a, a women's shelter in this neighborhood, and we also uh, host a, uh, a medical center, a dental clinic, both operated by Brownsville Multifamily Health Services. We have an extensive domestic violence and family safety program. We uh, provide services to chronically homeless veterans. We have after school and summer programs. We have a street soccer neighborhood program open to the, the community. And we also uh, operate daycare services. Sorry. 
<coughs> um, we uh, in total have 491 apartments in this immediate neighborhood and have just ren finished renovating 150 of the apartments, which was the first project we built uh, about uh, five years after this shelter was built. Um, we employ 228 uh, of our employees in this neighborhood and 82% of those employees live in the East Brooklyn community. So we uh, are strongly committed to, to the work in this community and, and have been uh, working here for a long time and hope we'll be here for a long time to come. The existing building, as you can see from the slide, is a very horizontal structure. It uh, reflects a time in, in this community when there was not a lot of demand for the space. And uh, the horizontal um, shelter spread out to encompass uh, almost the entire block. There is a private owner on one of the corners of the block. Um, the limitations are that it's an outdated shelter design, they're aging buildings, and not all units are ADA accessible. David, do you want to uh, speak to this? this is my, our housing director, David Clayhorn. <coughs> Hi, good evening. My name is David Claycorn. I'm the Chief Housing Officer at Help USA. I oversee the development of our permanent housing and the operation of our permanent housing. Uh, I just wanted to run through uh, briefly the unit mix and income uh, distribution that we're proposing in this project for the affordable housing buildings, not the, not the replacement of the shelter. So we, we, we currently um, are proposing um, two buildings that will be one project with HPD uh, finance through the ELLA program that will have a 30% set aside for formerly homeless, which you can see um, is 36 units. And then we will, we will be reserving um, 41 units, uh, additional 41, I'm sorry, um, additional 44% of the units will be one bedrooms, 26% two bedrooms, 15% three bedrooms, and they'll go along the uh, income tier from 30% to 40% to 50%. And then in consultation with HPD and other stakeholders, we are utilizing the, the new income averaging tool uh, in, the, in, the, in the tax credit code that allows us to go a little higher on income on the high end. And uh, essentially, those 70 and 80% units will allow us to pick up the 5% um, 30 percent, 5 percent, 40 percent, and 5 percent, 50 percent units. So in total, we're going to get 15 more <clears throat> extremely low income units, excuse me, um, by utilizing the income averaging. And on the chart below, you can see the uh, income range based on uh, family size and AMI and what that would relate to in, a, in terms of a monthly rent payment. On the supportive housing building, it's a little bit different. That's a 60 percent set aside for, for homeless with special needs, so that's 43 units. And the remainder of the units are, are, are dispersed between uh, one and two bedroom units with a, with a live-in super. And again, you can see the, the income distribution at the bottom. I'm gonna, I'm gonna hand it back over to Tom to talk about uh, the supportive services at the, at the buildings and at the shelter. Thank you, David. Um, we have a long history of commitment to uh, community-based services here in, in, in East New York. Um, the family shelter, which you see in the lighter blue, will have um, the 12,000 square foot of early childhood education space. Uh, we have had for a long time a daycare contracts with ACS and the City of New York. And those uh, spots are available both for children of the homeless shelter, for residents of our own apartments and for the community. So that's um, um, 12,000 square feet of that community serving and, and, and homeless shelter serving daycare. Uh, there's retail on the Sutter Avenue side and that is uh, roughly 1,500 square feet of, of retail. And on the Blake Avenue side on the, on the far side is another 2,500 square feet of retail. On the Snedeker side, there's a computer training center, 922 square feet, that will be utilizable by help staff um, for uh, computer training programs for the uh, homeless population, and also will be made available to not-for-profits or other groups that uh, seek to uh, bring um, computer training services to populations that from throughout this neighborhood. Um, in, let me just, one, a couple more things. We also will have uh, after school programs here. Uh, we're looking at arts and drama programs. 
and we're going to relocate our domestic violence services to uh, throughout these buildings so we'll have a lot of focus on family safety services and uh, we currently serve over 4,000 clients annually from the from East Brooklyn and Brooklyn and providing them with domestic violence programs uh, we are committed to uh, MWBE and local hiring. As I stated before, we ourselves employ 228 people who uh, live in East Brooklyn. Um, Monadnock will serve as our contractor. As you may know, they are based in Brooklyn and have a long experience of working um, in accord with local and minority hiring practices. We'll also work with uh, the East New York Local Development Corporation. Good evening. My name is Matthew Melody. I'm an architect with Curtis and Ginsburg Architects. Uh, we specialize in building high quality, energy efficient, affordable housing and supportive housing in New York City and working with nonprofits like Help USA. Uh, I'll go through this briefly so we can get to questions. Uh, Mark will speak to some sustainability elements as well. Uh, brief recap of the site. Like Tom was saying, it's between Blake Avenue and Sutter Avenue. Hinsdale Street and Sinetiker Avenue, nearly a full block. It is steps from the Sutter Avenue L train station and is along the Sutter Avenue commercial corridor. Surrounding the site is sort of a range of scales. There's these kind of vacant uh, industrial spaces to the north. There's helps mid-rise buildings just directly to the south. And then to the west are a row of Nehemiah homes to the east some uh, walk-up apartment buildings, and then further east, there's six-story walk-up buildings uh, as well. Like Tom said, this is being split up into four separate buildings. One of the benefits of doing this is we have that many more entries and lobbies around the site, creating increased pedestrian circulation around the site, more eyes on the street, and more security as well. Um, we're activating the ground floor through the multiple programs that Tom mentioned, the commercial spaces, the daycare, as well as support service office space for both the supportive building and the shelter building. And then along the large yellow piece down at the bottom, those are a series of apartment entries directly off of the street, maisonette apartments that will further increase uh, activity around the site. One of the really unique things about this project is we're excavating the entire cellar level to ensure that cellar spaces which contain the lobby, uh, the uh, laundry rooms, the fitness rooms, multi things like that all have access to light and air within them and they'll open onto large landscaped courtyards. Massing wise, we've concentrated the density and the height of this development at the two small ends of the block, like a typical New York City uh, block. And we've lowered the density down in the mid block uh, across from the more residential spaces. Again, you see we're using a variety of colors and brick textures to break down the scale of the building and give it a series and feel of a series of multiple buildings within it. The apartment, individual apartment entries off of Sinetiker Avenue will each have small yards or stoops in front of them that will be taken care of by HELPS staff, but will give a, a, a more residential and uh, intimate feel to the pedestrian experience. Along the Hinsdale Street side, we've kept the buildings low to mirror the adjacent existing building on the site and then stepped up towards the industrial portion to the north. So this is the first, uh, hi, I'm Mark Ginsburg, Curtis Ginsburg Architects. The first view of the courtyard from, of fa looking towards the shelter and, the, um, and a variety of spaces. And then these are two more sketches of, uh, more detailed sketches of different spaces at the shelter uh, and at the permanent housing. And I wanna just quickly talk about all the buildings will meet enterprise green communities. The two Ella buildings are planned to be passive house. The supportive housing and the Ella buildings are NYSERDA tier two. 
we're, pl we're planning to put photovoltaic panels on the supportive building. And I can go into more details if you have questions. And we're now is, um, in the middle of the Euler process having presented to the community board, but they have not made a decision, uh, come back with comments or a vote yet. Now presenting to the borough presidents. So this is just a brief outline of, 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 of what we hope to be the project schedule. Um, we will close on the financing of the new shelter uh, in spring of 2020, which will immediately be followed by the demolition of that shelter and then the conveyance of, of the land. We'll build the new shelter in the supportive housing building in one phase, although that'll be two separate financial transactions. And then hopefully in December of 2020, We'll close with HPD on the two Ella buildings, and they'll start construction. Um, so to somebody driving by, it's going to look like one construction job. Mandadnock is going to be the general contractor on all four buildings, uh, even though there'll be separate contracts and, and so forth. Um, by spring of 2022, uh, we expect the construction in the supportive housing building to be complete and leased up. And by the fall, uh, uh, by spring of 2023. Um, we would start leasing up the the two Ella buildings with hopefully finishing up by winter of 2023, which doesn't, which is closer than we think. So this is just sort of a, a, a summary. What we're doing here is we're is we're taking an asset that 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 exists um, that was that served a purpose at a per particular point in time, uh, repurposing that. Uh, by creating a new shelter that's purpose-built that will have a significantly uh, better methodology for delivering services to, to the folks living in shelter, and hopefully that will result in them finding permanent housing sooner. And then we leverage the rest of the block for needed affordable housing at, at very low income levels all the way up through um, um, 60 and 70% AMI. And I think we'll take questions now. Okay, so some of this information I saw was on the slide, but if you can um, take us through in, I guess, a little bit more detail in terms of the breakdown of the income range um, and also the anticipated rents per unit for um, the low income and supportive housing as well as the affordable housing, if you could just take us through. Sure, so we'll, we'll start here with the, with the proposed Ella building. Uh, it's, it's again, it's, it's two buildings, uh, but it will be one financing structure. For, so for all intents and purposes, it's one project. Um, we are doing 30% off the top. So 77 total apartments will be set aside for um, <clears throat> people in, in the shelter system. And that'll be divided up between studios and one bedrooms. So that'll be individuals and, and small families that would be referred through the Department of Homeless Services and HPD to the project. Um, we are an affordable housing, we are a supportive housing developer. Um, we have 24 other tax credit projects, spread amounts to uh, five or six different cities. We skew our incomes very low all the time. It's the mission of our organization. Um, and the realities of this transaction with the new change in law and the low income housing tax credit code provided an opportunity for us to provide lower income uh, units without subsidy by cross-subsidizing them with higher income individuals that are still low income. Um, so we have 5% of the total uh, set aside for 30%, which is very low income. Uh, and um, so it's 13 units each, 13 units at 30%, 13 units at 40%, and 13 units at 50%, which when you do the math is about 55% of the project is, un well, is, is under 50% AMI. Um, and that is, partly done through the R space program with HPD and it's and it's partly due to the fact that we have 70 and 80 percent AMI units so with the 50 percent local preference the 30 percent that are coming from the shelters are they part of that 50 percent local preference or that is separate and apart from the lottery I don't know the answer to that does HPD it's asking well, if the homeless set aside is part of the local preference 
So in order to maximize the opportunity for District 5 residents, are the the thirty percent homeless? Yes, I believe that that comes from DHS as well. The referrals, so, so they're not. Um, so, so the fifty percent local preference doesn't apply to so the fifty percent. Really the thirty percent homeless. Fifteen percent of the units that might be more in the realm of the expected incomes from households in District Five. So what you're saying is fifty. Four percent, and when you take out the thirty percent, right? Correct. You're really talking about seventy percent of the two fifty-five. Fifty percent of the seventy. Right. So you knock out those seventy-seven. So thirty-five percent of the, the two fifty-five. Basically, a hundred and eighty units. Correct. So of the hundred and eighty units, you're saying that not even a quarter of them can be afforded by most of the incomes we're seeing in that neighborhood. So this community may have a hard time meeting local preference with those numbers. So just putting that out there. Um, so that's why I'm asking the question about the lottery, because if the community doesn't secure a lot of the homeless units, they're going to have a hard time getting 50% of the development based on what you're showing us here. Yes. Um, that might be true, but I think um, this project's trying to accomplish a lot of things and hit different populations um, right. across but the city. Doing so less for the East New York population, perhaps. And I think that we've also heard feedback um, that there are, you know, um, children of, of families in East New York um, after graduating from college who can't find a place to stay in their community. So we, you know, the 70 and 80 percent would apply to that population. But I mean, you do have a point, you know, uh, about. But, but three, four years from now, if we find out we only secured 30% of the units, counting all those college returnees, is that gonna be deemed a successful project for the community? I don't know if I could answer that at this moment. But that, that's something we all have to think about between now and the final financing. Question is, are, do we need more reserves to this project? Yes. Mr. Barrick, if you're asking that would, would we be willing to work as hard as we can with DHS to um, uh, move families who have a historic connection to or whose last, um, who, or whose residence of origin before they entered the shelter system was East New York, the answer is yes. We would love to do that. The question is what is, what is legal in terms of the selection process? Because but, if you don't pull those to make up part of 30% with the remaining 70% of the units, are we going to do well with the local preference? When you add the two together, can we offset the fact that the 70% we may not do so well? So if we get more than 50% of that 30%, that may help offset mm -hmm. it. But if we get way less than 50% within that 30%, that's just adding to the lack of immediate community benefit as opposed to, yes, it's helping New York City mm -hmm. wonderfully, but it may be a project in New York that factors less for East New York. Mm -hmm. And two things. One is that the city is moving more and more toward local placement in shelter. So the, the, the people that are occupying these 195 units will be um, proportionately drawn from East Brooklyn and or Brooklyn. Um, if we could move those individuals into this housing or individuals who are in other shelter into this housing whose community of origin is the East Brooklyn neighborhoods, we would love to do that. I'm just not sure of, of the legality of the selection process and how that works. Anything we can do, we're more than willing to do. I, I think the more conversation you could have going to the city council and beyond to financing is all good. And we're even throughout the construction process. Yes, we're delighted to do that. Thank you. So the next question we had actually was on um, supportive housing, which you've already, you've already uh, touched on. So the next question I wanted to talk about dealt with the um, borough president, his concern of displacement of seniors. So an average of nearly 60% of area median income would disqualify too many of the seniors. To what extent would the envisioned project financing make it possible to achieve rents affordable to households at 30 to 40% AMI? And if you go back to the other slide, that'd be helpful too. So the question is, how can we try to configure the, 
the uh, income limits on the apartments to be more affordable to seniors. In, in the context of the 30 and 40 percent AMIs, the, obviously the studios, there aren't any. The one bedrooms, seniors, if, the, if they apply, they have a chance to get those units. And then if you go to the supportive housing building, if you have more details, that would help augment the answer. Well, one, one, one thing that, that we could look at doing is creating more one bedrooms of the, in the 30 percent homeless set aside and moving those studios over to the 30 and 40 percent AMI, which would be more available to seniors. That would be, that would be where I would start if, if, we wanted to, if we wanted to do that, because that would, that would allow us to have more units in the 30 percent homeless set aside for small families, as well as more units for seniors. I think that's an interesting approach. And then if you could talk within the supportive building. So the supportive building is, is you know, 60% of it is set aside for, for formerly homeless. Um, and so that, that's 43 apartments. Um, I actually, I'm sorry, yeah, that's 43 apartments. They're all studios. Um, and we, only, we have 15 additional apartments. One is for a super. Um, so we have two one, seven one-bedrooms and two two-bedrooms. Um, I think we could play around with that mix and, and skew. Um, well, I shouldn't speak for the architect. So I just want to jump in. Um, so the low-income housing tax credit provides an opportunity for you to get some AMIs that seniors might afford. Mm -hmm. And I'm told that the HPD typical requirements within the affordable having a consistent blend of one bedrooms for all the AMIs, that that is not the case for the supportive building. So if you could look at having a bedroom mix that maybe gets you some 40s, maybe 50s that are studios and ones, that may be a way to right. get more senior opportunities. We, we, could, we could certainly look at that on the one bedrooms, um, on, on the supportive housing building for sure. I and, think and studios are also fine. Mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. okay. And I think you talk, touched on some of this as well in your presentation in terms of marketing strategies for the tenant selection process. Um, would such marketing strategy start off with like a financial literacy campaign to assist residents in becoming uh, lottery eligible? Uh, we're currently um, starting the lease up process on what you would know as Site 9 on Livonia Avenue, um, which was part of the HPD RFP a number of years ago. We're the last, we're the last of, that, of those nine finishing up. And we've had, um, we've had very good success with uh, the, the, the East New York LDC working with them as housing ambassadors um, to work with residents to, to get them lottery ready. And then we will be, we have a, a full service property management staff um, that, pro that, that works out of our central office and, and our East New York campus. And we would be hiring for the lease up process, which would start before the buildings were finished. We'll also be hiring a number of temp workers to, to help people with paperwork and process applications. But we'd be relying um, with, we'd be relying most likely on the, on the LDC uh, for the service. All right. And regarding the uh, commercial floor area, has there been any consideration for um, affordable retail or possibly maybe a local arts organization, a cultural institution? Yes, so we have two, res we have two commercial, what quote unquote commercial sections. One is in the shelter on Sutter Avenue. Um, because that building is being financed through Department of Homeless Services contract, the commercial portion is not eligible for financing through DHS. So we, we help is financing that ourselves. It's not a very expensive space. So we're only underwriting about $5 a square foot on that space. And our intention is that we would make that available um, to uh, businesses or startups or people that, that in the community that need that kind of retail space but can't afford 20, 23, 24 dollars a square foot. Uh, similarly, on the Blake side, we have um, residential space. We have to charge a little bit more for that because it's rolled into the HPD financing of that building. But right now, I think we're running that at 14 dollars a square foot, which is below market. I can't, I can't sit here and say without a doubt that that won't creep up a little bit as we get closer to a closing. But the intention is that that would be available again for. Um, organizations that 
are starting out that, that can't afford to pay as much or that are, have some other benefit to the, to the larger community or the community that, that, we, that we will be operating. And in terms of arts and the supportive housing building, one of the things that we've learned from operating family housing for, for many years is that when you build family housing and you, move, and you move people in, there are a lot of small children, a lot of babies, and they grow up there. Um, so when we design family and youth services programs, they have to be designed in an ability to grow with the children because most of our residents don't actually leave. Um, so in the supportive housing building, we're designing space on the, I don't like to use the word, the cellar level, but it has natural light from the courtyard garden level. Um, that will be a multi-purpose space that will have ceiling heights and so forth that, are L, that, that would allow it to be used as a theater um, or dance facility. Um, that building, we chose that building because of, as a supportive housing building, it will have 24 hour a day security. So if we're bringing people from outside uh, into the space to use that space, they can check in and we can have, a, have an idea of who's in the building. And then that will face out to the courtyard uh, for, the, for the residents in the other buildings. And, and yeah, again, we're not underwriting a rent to that. Um, so we will be looking to partner with, uh, pr uh, hopefully, uh, a local arts organization that would do that um, and operate that space. Um, and, and so we'll be reaching out. We've, we've had some conversations, brief conversations, with, with some stakeholders in the community, and we're going to continue to do that. So I think that's a wonderful piece. So I guess getting a stronger sense, like, how many hours a week that that might be the situation where an organiz outside organization could help run that space, not only for the residents in the building, but for the wider community? 40 to 60 hours a week, it would be their space. That, that's I don't want to run an arts program. I don't, I'm not considered an expert in that field. I would like to make a space available for one or two organizations in total who would have pretty much the entire use of, that, of those spaces. Space or spaces. So you're expecting any lease income for help them do that, or simply them coming in there for free as long as it's almost like free service to? They run the program. The program serves homeless, the persons in our housing, the persons from the community, and um, they have the financing to run their program. We make the space available for if there's a need to charge a very, very, very small fee, we would do that, but my envision is we would charge nothing. Or like, for example, that Maybe some insurance or something like right. that. Right, or that their fee might be to the outside uh, residents, low-income residents, but that, for example, the support of population, Thank you. the shelter, get freebies for exchange of rent. That would be nice, yes. That, something like that, yes. I'm very excited about this. Yeah, it sounds really nice. <laughs> okay, and so, so the last question deals with the borough president is very concerned um, with renewable and sustainable energy. So has there been any consideration uh, to promote practices such as uh, retaining stormwater runoff, incorporating passive house design, solar panels, blue, green, or white roof covering, or DEP rain gardens? Uh, yes, uh, but I'll let um, uh, Mark from Curtis and Ginsburg answer that. I would say um, both Snedeker and Hinsdale currently have um, bioswale tree pits that the city put in uh, recently, um, so those will those will be retained and protected during construction or replaced if we if if they're if they need to be. Um, but Mark, thank you. We're we're doing. Is a lot of this as much as we can and wherever we can pushing the envelope. So two of the buildings are meant to be passive house. The other two can't be certified as passive house because of the program, but will be basically as energy efficient as a passive house. We're, um, we're going to keep the bioswales and the tree pits on the streets that are there now. We're looking to put um, planting tray systems on the roofs or there will be white roofs. We are retaining water both on the roofs and then in detention tanks, the building to minimize um, water during rain events. Um, and I can answer, we have a whole list of water conserving and energy efficient features in the buildings. And just two quick things based on earlier things. So the childcare, you mentioned 12,000 square feet. 
Do you have a ballpark and a number of uh, children that could be provided uh, on a daily basis based on that size? We're serving right now in slightly smaller space, somewhere around 80 kids a day. Um, we're applying for funding right now through the new DOE Head Start funding program. Um, could that be 100 kids? I, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't really know. It also depends upon the model that DHS uh, wants us to um, deploy for, for, the, for the homeless population. Some of that's more of a drop-in or, or a daycare model as opposed to a more formal early childhood education. As we go along and get this finalized, we'll have better numbers. But we run, um, we run uh, ACS-funded uh, uh, daycare in, in three of our shelters, two in South Bronx and this one in, in uh, Help One in Brooklyn. And also very quick, um, given the second series of buildings will start at least six months later, assuming the closing delays correspond with the billing department cycle as well. So is there any logistical reason to not consider keeping for six more months the, the building, the shelter buildings that wouldn't be needed to initiate the first series of construction to buy a little more phasing time, because even though these units may be 33 years old, may be not as uh, nice as they were 33 years ago, but they may also be a lot nicer than some of the shelters throughout the city. So if you were to buy our inventory another maybe 100 units for six more months, is that something that could be coordinated? That was our original thought when we first uh, put pen to paper on this project um, because of the way the original building was built in sections. Um, it became very problematic and, and um, very costly to, to look to do that, to tear down, say, half of each tier. We would have to build a wall. You'd have to build a, a, a fire lane for fire access. You have to put water back there, dust control mitigation efforts. and, and um, the utility, the utility shutoffs under the one uh, under because it's one address um, became rapidly sort of became too much brain damage to try to figure out. Um, and then we had conversations with Department of Homeless Services because the original reason we were doing that was to reduce the capacity strain overall in New York on shelter space. Um, but we were able to secure a new family shelter in Queens that will, while it's not the same neighborhood obviously, it will replace that capacity almost in full. So for a lot of reasons, mainly that we would have been running up the expenses that HPD would have had to help fund and DHS would have had to help fund on a city site and they're sort of paying each other and, and, it, and we just made a collective decision that it would be easier to go this way. Thank you. And please be assured that the city's plan is not to move children from this location to another shelter, but is to place every family in this shelter into permanent housing before demolition. So we don't have another school transfer, we don't have another family disruption. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak or anyone who would like to speak that has not submitted a speaker slip? Okay, hearing none, if Richard, if you could please close this item. Calendar item number four is closed. Calendar item number five, 180524 ZMK, 180525 ZRK. These applications submitted by Fleet Center Inc. pursuant to sections 197-C and 201 of the New York City Charter for a zoning map amendment to rezone the property at 101 Fleet Place from an R6 district to an AC64 district with the extension of the special downtown Brooklyn district and a zoning text amendment to designate the project area a mandatory inclusionary housing area. Such actions would facilitate the development of a four-story, 200, excuse me, 14-story, 210,000 square foot commercial and community facility building with a maximum height of 196 feet. Would Raymond Levin, the representative for this application, please state your name for the record and present the application. Exactly the name you mentioned. Raymond Levin is my name. And I'm with Herrick Feinstein. Um, we're counsel to, uh, to Fleet Center, Inc., uh, applicant uh, for this proposed zoning change. Um, with me this evening is Joe McKenzie with uh, PHA, uh, environmental consultants. Uh, Nebel Goxabe from Marvell Architects, and uh, 
Jackie Williams from 99 Solutions. Uh, they will be here to answer any questions in their areas of expertise. I will handle all areas that don't need expertise. Um, as you mentioned, we're seeking a, a zoning change. Uh, the site is, uh, is R6. Uh, and ah, and uh, there it is. It's currently occupied by a one-story building uh, with uh, the Duffield uh, Children's Center in it, uh, a, a daycare center um, run by uh, Brooklyn uh, Community Services. Um, the, uh, we're seeking to change that zoning to uh, extend uh, the C64 district, which is across the street, uh, and the special downtown Brooklyn district uh, onto this site to allow uh, the 14-story commercial uh, office building that you mentioned. Um, you can see in this uh, image, uh, the site is outlined in blue. Uh, surrounding it uh, is University Towers. Uh, to the north is uh, Ingersoll Houses. Um, to the west, uh, several very tall uh, residential buildings on Flatbush Avenue. Um, and immediately to the north, uh, some recently built uh, uh, residential houses. Um, this shows how it would fit into the context of the surroundings. Um, so the, this shows the di different heights. The building would be um, in context with its surroundings. Um, the uh, the 15 story buildings that uh, were built by Casamitidis, uh, University Towers are all 15. Our building will be slightly higher because Commercial floor to floor heights are higher than residential floor to floor heights. However, it will be significantly lower um, than, uh, excuse me, the Eagle, which is across the street in 30 stories, the Torn, which is 37. Uh, also across the street is a large site, mostly controlled by uh, the Gutman family, which could uh, see the development at some point of a building in the, in the 30 to 40 uh, story range. Uh, further along Flatbush Avenue, we're all aware of the city, uh, city point uh, and uh, some very tall buildings. Um, this, uh, this shows uh, what, we're, uh, what our building will, will encompass. Um, it's, it has on the lower floors about 17,000 square foot floors, on the upper floors uh, 13, 13 and a half thousand floors. Um, we uh, are targeting this for small commercial not-for-profit businesses. Um, uh, the Lesser Group, which uh, is the parent of uh, a Fleet Center, uh, that is their um, bread and butter. They own 40 buildings, uh, uh, and 21 of which are in Brooklyn, spread across the borough. Um, and those uh, buildings run the, run the gamut. The smallest is about 6,000 feet. Uh, they also own uh, 111 Livingston uh, down the block from here, which is quite larger. Um, their tenants um, uh, are, um, some of them I guess I can list the names, their Institute of Cultural Living, uh, uh, Emblem Health, um, Board of Education, they do many schools are in their properties, um, Weight Watchers, uh, Jewish Board of Family Services, and on and on. Those are the type of uh, tenants that they have, uh, and those are the tenants that they know, and that's how uh, they expect this building to be uh, tenanted. Um, downtown Brooklyn has seen the loss of a lot of smaller office users, uh, attorneys, uh, accountants, uh, as, uh, as downtown Brooklyn has gotten more expensive as larger uh, office users have come in. Um, so this building can fill that uh, sort of niche uh, for the downtown Brooklyn uh, community. Um, I'll, I'm going to turn it over to, uh, to the architect, to Nebel, to talk about the uh, features of this building and what we've done to try and uh, make it uh, work well in, uh, in the community. Uh, good evening, Neville Gachibai with Marvel Architects. I'm just going to go back for one moment. 
Um, just to point out the footprint of the site, it's a fairly small site and kind of an awkward shape. Um, so there wasn't a lot of articulation opportunities um, on the site. Um, so um, moving to the ground plane and the one exposed facade on the south, um, we tried to kind of make those as uh, presentable and, and um, uh, as an asset uh, to the, the project in the street and, and its uh, frontage. So at the streetscape, um, Fleet Place is a narrow street. Um, the city has ambitions to um, pursue street widening on the block. Um, we work with uh, Brooklyn City Planning to kind of look at the groundscape and make our sidewalk a little bit wider. Um, so in the first two stories, the, the main building is, main portion of the building is set back a minimum of two feet. And then at the inset in the blue, um, it's pushed back an additional 14 feet. Um, so you have kind of a very large um, open space in, in front of the lower portion of the building uh, to kind of address the, the narrow street relationship. Um, and also making it two stories to allow light to get to the kind of lower either office or retail space that, that takes over the, um, the ground floor. Um, this is the, the space represented um, in plan. You can see the ground floor plan on the left. Uh, as well as kind of the blow up showing the um, extent of Fleet Place um, and the kind of inset on the, um, on the facade. Um, plan doesn't particularly point out uh, street trees, but street trees would be implemented as, as per zoning. Um, and uh, along with the adjustments, the, the curb, if we could go along with DOT to kind of incorporate green infrastructure like bioswales or that nature on this kind of narrow street. Um, we definitely kind of strive to do that. The other element on the, the property uh, is um, the south facade, um, which because of University Towers being a height factor site, there's a lot of open space um, around our building that will probably stay that way for a long time. So we have a kind of butterfly facade um, fronting their property and, and kind of highly visible along Fleet Place. Um, so on the lower portion, it fronts on their, um, their outdoor play area um, at the moment. So um, the hope is that we can kind of engage some um, arts entity or um, a similar organization to kind of embellish the, the lower portion of the, um, the facade at the um, facing university towers. And then on the upper facade, we have this kind of unique butterfly shape. We have a lot of solar exposure. Um, so we're looking at ways to um, play with masonry as a facade and fenestration to provide a little bit of texture. Um, these are kind of three studies we had done, um, but kind of using some of the old Brooklyn vernacular to kind of add shadow, add depth um, uh, to, to a substantial facade, um, as well as kind of uh, incorporating fenestration where we can. We have a core facing this side of the building. Um, so to the extent possible, we would um, add windows to the, uh, uh, to the office space on the upper floors. Um, this is a view um, from Flatbush of the building. Um, as Ray mentioned, the site in the foreground is currently um, the boarded up um, car wash um, that has the ability to eventually obstruct this view, but at the moment we have the uh, option to, to show you the, the building from this vantage point. And um, that's kind of the extent of it. So we're, uh, we're here to answer any uh, questions you might have. So we have a few questions for you. So as you know, the proposed development would displace an existing child care center that is under the auspices of the New York City Department of Education. What consideration has been given to reestablishing an affordable space for child care services within the development? Well, um, for the, the, the lease is with Brooklyn Children's Services. So just, it's, it's not with the city. Um, okay. This is a, a facility where um, if you are a, a eligible for subsidies, you can uh, have your child here for free, but if not, uh, there's a sliding scale. Um, the mm -hmm. the uh, center has mm -hmm. been uh, operating here for a number of years uh, on a year-to-year -year basis. Um, they've always known that uh, that there would, would at some point be a development. Um, we've extended their lease for another year to help them um, 
have the time to find uh, another space. Um, their board includes a uh, real estate, downtown Brooklyn real estate broker. So uh, we're hopeful that they will find um, uh, space, temporary or permanent, uh, to serve the population that they serve. They're currently serving uh, 50 children uh, last year. Um, we, we would love to have them come back um, and we'll make an arrangement with them for uh, below market uh, rent. Um, they would have to tell us whether that was uh, something acceptable to them um, in the relatively near future since the building design would have to accommodate uh, their use, which is not a sort of standard use. Um, and, um, and I, th I think that's it. Right now, right now we don't know where, where they're going to go on an interim basis. Brooklyn Children's Services are uh, are located at 285 Skirmahorn Street at their main offices. Um, we actually have uh, a lease with them for another center uh, on Rockway Boulevard. Uh, so it's a relationship with them is, is uh, long, long standing and, uh, and uh, both sides understand each other. So going beyond this particular center, um, given what city needs may be, has any dialogue uh, been initiated with the Agency for Children's Services, for example, to see if there is interest in opening more facilities within this neighborhood, uh, or if there are other facilities that might time where they're under real estate pressure elsewhere, and this would be a uh, safe haven for them to relocate. So I was wondering if that type of dialogue has started. No, we, as I said, we don't have a relationship with uh, Agency for Children's Services. Would you like us to help facilitate that conversation. We don't run, we don't run facilities, we lease space. We're, we're a commercial landlord. So uh, would you so like, right, right now, right tenant. now at that, at that location, we're hoping uh, uh, if, uh, if this rezoning is approved um, to be redeveloping that space. Uh, and in the future, we will be renting to the types of tenants, which I mentioned before, uh, who are the tenants that know us and that we uh, provide space for. Um, at, the, at the moment, um, as I said, having a relationship with ACS, I'm not sure what that, how that would help. Well, if they have a need to provide seats in this particular geographic area, and if they could figure out operators that they could then lease a facility and give them the contract to run a facility, if the timing is right for this space to be the solution, then... Sure. So we could talk uh, tomorrow and uh, see if we could uh, connect you with somebody. Yeah, or tomorrow's okay. within the months ahead, if you'd like. Well, the day after tomorrow, no, because... All right, but you could reach back to our office and we could uh, figure out who would contact ACS to have a dialogue with your client. Fine. Okay. okay, so we have a few more questions. The second question is a uh, three-part three question. The first part is what, what other forms of community facility use have been contemplated, which is the first part, and also what consideration has been given to the residents of Ingersoll and Whitman houses in terms of determining appropriate community facility use? And the last part is what percent of the building would be set aside for such uses? Well, in, in, this, in the sense of setting aside, yeah, I'll, I'll go back over the, the list of the, of the tenants that are in uh, our 21 buildings in Brooklyn. Uh, the vast majority of them are either not-for-profits, community facilities, or, or New York City. Um, so that's who, uh, who our client uh, leases to. Um, and that's who will, in all likelihood, uh, be the tenants in this building because that's who they know and work with throughout the borough. Um, in terms of setting aside, uh, the building is, is set aside. Um, I'm, I'm trying to, I don't know how to articulate it. 
who else do you expect to come to this building? I guess is what I'm saying. I mean, the, the, these are the tenants that we, that we have. Um, we're not looking for anything else. We're not looking to do uh, a building full of uh, an insurance company or, a, or a, big, a big tenant. The other buildings in, in downtown Brooklyn are being built to accommodate those people. We're looking for the small, not-for-profit community facility, medical offices. That's what we do. So I, I don't know how, in terms of setting aside a percentage, in a sense it's 100%, um, because those are the people that we serve. Some of them are not. If you have a small law office or, or an insurance broker or an accounting firm, they'll be there too. They don't fit into those categories. Um, but by and large, the people who, who are tenants in our buildings fit into the categories that you mentioned. So some of these uses have different abilities to pay rent and others need more help. So the question is, from public purpose, how much of this future building might be in a realm more of a public purpose where they don't have as great an ability and other uses that might pay a bit more closer to the rents happening elsewhere in downtown Brooklyn. So that's, I think, the crust of this. Is, that, is the value going to be whatever the optimum community facility tenants that they have relationships tend to pay, or are there some that will be able to pay somewhat less? Well, how, how are you suggesting that those get selected? I mean, if, if, if you're talking about a set aside for lower, uh, for a, a, a discounted rent, uh, how do those people get, set, you know, get picked? Who, who are the lucky people? Um, we've, we've discussed this with a council person, um, and we're discussing it here this evening. Uh, we're certainly willing to do that. Um, the question is, um, who, who are we talking about? Um, uh, in terms of Ingersoll houses, we've met with them. We met with the Tenants Association. Uh, their concern uh, seemed to be uh, uh, medical facilities and social services. Those are the kinds of things that, that we do throughout the borough. Uh, so we're pretty sure that we'll be able to do it here. Okay, thank you. So uh, the next question deals with renewable and sustainable energy. Um, what consideration has been given for incorporating passive house design, solar panels, blue roof, and white roof covering, and DEP rain gardens? This seems to be a pattern of this question. Yeah. Um, I will turn it over to the architect. Okay. Because I'm <laughs> you notice we didn't ask it under gem gardens. Uh, so, uh, as I pointed out before, the, it's a fairly small footprint site, and the building covers the majority of it. Um, being small and kind of the mechanical that would be associated with this, I didn't necessarily foresee solar kind of being um, attainable on this site. Um, but uh, by default, we would definitely be kind of doing a blue roof system, um, uh, uh, retaining the water um, uh, in the project, and um, uh, if there's enough flexibility um, to incorporate green roofs. We have two lower terraces. Um, that would make sense if they were extensive, um, but I mean intensive. You could also potentially propose, um, you know, more of a simple sedum um, uh, on the kind of remainder of the mechanical roof on the, on the top floor. Um, passive house um, probably is, is not likely here. Um, and um, we haven't gotten into the conversations about cogen on the site for a commercial building. Um, sometimes it doesn't play well because you don't have the turnover um, that you might with a residential building. Um, and then as I mentioned before, um, you know, with the city's street winding effort and this, um, uh, we've looked into kind of starting the conversation or looking into the programs that allow for rain garden kind of development beyond the, the basic street tree um, uh, approach and we'd be interested in kind of going forward with that if um, the city had, a, had the program to accommodate it or desire to. So another area, because you have, you want to call it your butterfly facade, yep. um, and you mentioned about the sun and all that, like even things such as uh, 
vertical plantings that might be integrated, that there's a lot of opportunity. It's almost like a pallet to provide unique opportunities that we don't typically see. I mean, I, I agree. I think there could be unique uh, opportunities. I don't necessarily think you could do a, a grow wall, you know, the entire building, um, but along the lines of that approach to the lower facade that kind of fronts um, your, your street articulation and the, the play yard, um, uh, that could be a solution that we could work with an artist. Um, access would need to be sorted because it has to be maintained and it's fronting on University Towers kind of property. Um, so as we kind of looked as, uh, to find a way to embellish the kind of lower portion of the, the south facing wall that kind of the public interacts with, um, that could be a, a strategy. And how much an easement would you project to say if you had somewhat of a green wall um, that you would need worked out? Uh, I, I couldn't say. I mean, I, if it required a scaffold to maintain, you're, you know, thinking, you know, you're in eight to 15 feet, just to, you know, having staging for a scaffold kind of scenario. Um, not in a, you know, all the time kind of scenario, but if you had to take it down fully or put it back up, you need that kind of access. Thank you. So our last question deals with uh, good quality jobs, and that's basically a, that's a main focus of the borough president. So what steps will be take what steps will be taken to ensure the inclusion and participation of minority and women-owned businesses and local business enterprises? Well, I can start off by saying that 32BJ is going to be uh, servicing this building, uh, assuming that it is uh, uh, approved. Um, and I'd like to turn it over to Jackie Williams, who, uh, who's been involved with uh, those kind of programs on many projects. Thank you. Hi. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Um, first and foremost, um, I'd like to say for one-on-one -on -one fleet, I'm glad my client, uh, with a little nudging, um, now his new favorite term is 32BJ, so thank you. He, I got on his last nerves and we all worked together and made that happen. So the fact that he made a commitment to that showed me that that was the beginning to the commitment that he's gonna continue to make on the other workforce development commitments in terms of our partnerships with Ingersoll Housing. And I'm gonna say Ingersoll first because that's the first, our neighbor, our community partner, uh, the person, the group of people we have to look at every day in terms of one-on-one -on -one fleet. I've had conversations with uh, Mr. Burgess, and this is not a subject matter that I take lightly as a consultant, so there's no just, you know, oh, we're going to do business with you, and it's just back and forth, and we're going to sign a piece of paper. Um, Daryl and I had a conversation about 30 days ago on the 30th, and we have some preliminary discussions and we're gonna tie that up probably before we hit the city council, but it looks as if we're gonna come and close on our workforce development piece and it is going to be an outside consultant that he and I are gonna be happy about as a team to ensure that Fleet 101 executes on. Okay, in terms of it's gonna be a workforce development consultant that has some skill set in the MWLBE and we're gonna concentrate more on the L and more on the M than the W in this particular situation. Because we know that the numbers are higher and easier to meet on the M and the L in this particular 11201 and 11231 zip code area and that's how we're going to target it so that's a little bit of homework we've done thus far we have no paper inked um and that's the way that is our strategy mr burgess and i but we have not closed as of yet and i think looking to the nitro requirement i think it's called section three in terms of like if you were doing direct contracting on the nitro campus if there might be ways to figure out how to coordinate with the NYCHA residents to be able to be part of the job stream under construction? Well, that would be a part of the agenda of the consultant that we're going to partner with vis-a-vis -vis Mr. Burgess' responsibility as the tenant association leader. I would think that he would push his agenda to ensure that his neighbors get to recycle and be a part of the recycling agenda. 
And that's why I went to him as the leader of his home base. Because who am I to dictate who eats? That's his responsibility. But that's why I'm gonna lay it where it needs to lay. But I know that's where we need to go. And he's giving us direction on how we need to work, how to be respectful. And we're gonna close on that transaction before we get too far down the line. But I just didn't wanna just jump in and say, oh, let's do this and let's do that. And it's not meaningful. I wanna make sure it's meaningful and done correctly. Thank you so much. Ms. You're Williams. welcome. Okay, so we have two speakers. First speaker is Stephen Yearwood from 32BJ. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is uh, Stephen Yearwood, and I work at Clinton Hill Apartment Owners Corporation that's in Brooklyn. And I've been, I've been a member of 32BJ for 21 years. And today on behalf of my union, I'm here today on behalf of my union to express our support for the proposed development at 101 Fleet Street. As you know, 32BJ is the largest property service union in this country. We represent over 80,000 members across New York City. Members like myself clean and maintain office in school buildings like one being discussed tonight. We are happy to report that the applicant for this project, the lesser group, the lesser group has made a credible commitment to pay the future building service workers at this site prevailing wages. A prevailing wage job like mine allows working family in this city to live with dignity. We estimate that the project will generate nine building service jobs, and we believe they will provide an important economic opportunity for members of the surrounding community. We urge you to approve this project. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker, Mary Lou, May, excuse me, May Lou, Senior Director of Real Estate for Downtown Brooklyn Partnership. Good evening. Uh, my name is May Yu. I'm the Senior Director of Real Estate at the Downtown Brooklyn Partnership, as you just stated. And on behalf of the partnership, um, I'm expressing our strong support of this uh, proposed rezoning and redevelopment project at 101 Fleet Place. Um, as the applicant team mentioned, uh, by expanding the special downtown Brooklyn district just uh, across the street, across Fleet Place, the project would yield uh, more than 200,000 square feet of commercial space um, with small floor plate office space that's highly de um, in demand in downtown Brooklyn. Um, over the past few years, uh, at the partnership and uh, with our partners in the uh, research institutions across the city, we've seen a strong record uh, job and business growth in uh, downtown Brooklyn, outpacing that of the borough and of the city, despite having a very constrained office market. Uh, the vacancy rate in uh, downtown Brooklyn has been about uh, between 2 and 8% for the past five years, and that's lower than uh, the vacancy rate in the other uh, major uh, office districts in uh, New York City, lower than that of Midtown, uh, the Flatiron District, Lower Manhattan, um, and Long Island City. Um, today, uh, downtown Brooklyn continues to see strong demand for office space, particularly from startups and small businesses. Uh, the smaller floor plate office space has become uh, really uh, in high demand and uh, new, market pro new projects to the market, um, such as United American Lands 397 Bridge Street, has seen really rapid leasing for small floor plate office uh, with tenants such as the Recur Center um, Billy Cotton, Propel, and others that have relocated to downtown Brooklyn from Manhattan and elsewhere given the, the uh, high transit access and um, talented workforce that is in Brooklyn. Uh, furthermore, there's been precedent for successful commercial density um, on narrow streets east of Flatbush Avenue. Uh, the Clock Tower building, which is just a, a block or so north of this site, 
um, is a seven-story property with a variety of um, creative tenants and a few nonprofit tenants as well, such as um, NYU Tandon, um, who has student facilities there, uh, Arc Media, and 100 Chickens Productions. And that building is located on Gold Street on a similar kind of 60-foot wide street, uh, very similar to Fleet Place. Uh, Green Desk, um, a thriving co-working space home to dozen of, dozens of companies, is also located just across Fleet Place to the west. Um, and numerous calls we've tried to send um, small businesses who are looking for space to their facility, and they've had a very low vacancy and loan turnover as well. So again, just kind of reflecting on the demand for a small floor play office. Um, and then furthermore, um, LIU's Brooklyn campus, which has significant institutional office space, is also just one block to the south. Again, just highlighting kind of the consistent um, precedent for successful um, commercial density in office. Um, and lastly, there is, um, you know, we strongly believe that this project is in context with the neighboring uh, buildings, both um, residential uh, mixed use and office. Again, it's uh, the 14-story height is entirely compatible with the adjacent 15-story buildings, uh, university towers, as well as the much uh, higher density and, and taller buildings along Flatbush Avenue, just a block away. Um, in summary, 101 Fleet Place is a project that will enhance the uh, downtown Brooklyn community and bring much needed small floor plate commercial office to sustain the job and business growth we've seen in the district. I uh, strongly urge you to support this project. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to speak that has not submitted a speaker slip? Okay, hearing none, Richard, if you would please close this item. Calendar item number five is closed. Calendar item number six. 190305ZMK. This application submitted by 6003 8th Avenue LLC pursuant to sections 197-C and 201 of the New York City Charter for a zoning map amendment affecting several properties on the southeast corner of the intersection of 8th Avenue and 60th Street. The proposed actions would eliminate a C1-3 overlay from an existing R6 district and establish an AC4-2 district in order to legalize a three-story, 3,800-square-foot commercial building in Brooklyn Community District 12. Community Board 12 voted to approve this application on June 25, 2015. Would David Rosenberg, the representative for this application, please state your name for the record and present the application. Thank you, good evening. My name is David Rosenberg of Sheldon Lobel PC on behalf of the applicant. And we are proposing a zoning map amendment in the Sunset Park neighborhood of Brooklyn at the corner of 60th Street and 8th Avenue to change an existing R6 C13 district to a C42 commercial district. Um, the proposed rezoning area has been an R6 C13 district since the adoption of the 1961 zoning resolution but the area has seen a lot of change. There is a manufacturing district just to the southeast, and the most recent rezoning in the area, as you can see here on the zoning map, you can see that just on the other side of the M district is a C42 district and a C42A district. This rezoning, unlike many rezonings, is not about changing the density in the particular area, but is about changing the zoning to reflect the existing built conditions in the area that the market dictates. As you can see in this land use map over here, much, the uses in and around the rezoning area, while the area is zoned primarily for residential and local retail, is actually developed as largely commercial buildings, including not just the ground floor, but on the upper floors of the building. And this proposed rezoning as a C24 reflects this particular area's position as a kind of buffer between the manufacturing zone and the residential zone to the north and east. You can see the zoning map amendment over here showing just what the changed zoning map will look like. A small 100 by 150 foot area just adjacent to the M1 zone. That would be changing to the C42 district. Um, as a matter of bulk, this comparison chart shows what the differences are as a matter of bulk and use for the proposed rezoning compared to what we have now. Under the R6 C13, uh, use groups one through four and use group six are permitted. Um, bulk allows for 3.0 residential with quality housing along a wide street, 3.9 for airs, 4.8 for community facility, and 2 FAR commercial, and 4.8 for community facility in total. 
looking at the column all the way on the right, you see what the proposed bulk is, uses in bulk are. The only changes are the introduction of use groups 8, 9, and 10, and 12, which are local service establishments in addition to the local retail establishments. And the only change to bulk, as you can see, is that permitted commercial floor area increases from two FAR with a limit to commercial FAR where there's residential above to the first floor to allowing a total of 3.4 FAR for commercial use. The residential use and the community facility use maximum bulk remains the same in both scenarios. As you can see here, I particularly want to call attention to picture number one on this slide that shows actually all of the properties in the rezoning area where you can see that the while these buildings were zoned at one point for residential, that the predominant use here is for commercial uses such local law offices, accounting offices, an insurance company on the upper floors of these buildings. And as you can see on the far end, and more clearly in picture four on this slide, two buildings of recent construction that utilize the approximately 4.8 FAR community facility bonus to max out the height in FAR at one of them at 4.77 and one at 4.47 to essentially max out the FAR. And so with that, I'm happy to take any questions about this rezoning. Okay, sure, I have two questions for you. Given the maximum permitted floor area of 4.8 FAR of all the possible zoning districts that permit two-story commercial development with residential uses above and that would generally approximate such floor area potential, what was the rationale for the requested C4-2 district? Yeah. So, as I mentioned, the real emphasis behind this rezoning is not to create any kind of new development. There's no redevelopment proposed as part of this rezoning. It is to bring the existing character of this neighborhood into compliance and conformance with the underlying zoning. And so, when we talk about the actual zone, you look at the different possibilities, and there are a lot of different possibilities that we could have looked at over here. Um, particularly with respect to zones that include two FAR of commercial, um, we're really talking about the universe of commercial overlay districts, your C1 and C2 districts. Um, those allow for two FAR of commercial, but limit commercial use to the ground floor where there are residential units above. And when we talk about the proposed rezoning to legalize the existing condition, looking at this chart of compliance and conformance, for the different buildings in the proposed rezoning area. All of them have commercial floor area above the 2.0 that would be allowed by a commercial overlay district. So that really pushes us into the territory of proposing a C4 district. And so the options then plausibly become C42, C42A, and C44A, the latter of two are contextual districts. The problem with bringing in a contextual district is that you eliminate the community facility bonus, which does two things. One, it eliminates the possibility of bringing in new community facilities to service people who live and work in the area, and also bring some of the buildings in the proposed rezoning area, particularly those on 60th Street that are of recent construction, and actually brings them into non-compliance because those have floor areas, which include a community facility bonus, that would exceed the permitted community facility density in each of these, which are either 3.0 or 4.0, depending on the density. To have all of these buildings in compliance and use a contextual district that, that imposes an absolute height limitation would require something more akin to a C4-5 district, which introduces an R8A equivalent for residential, which introduces a level of bulk to this district that we don't need for this application and that we don't, we don't want to bring it this time. So you also mentioned uh, in terms of the C2 um, limited with residential, but actually there are districts that don't exist in Brooklyn, uh, C26 through C29, that allow the 2FAR and allow the, um, the floor area, obviously, then to have residential above. So just clarity, of the seven properties affected, how many actually exceed two FAR commercial, not counting community facility uses that might be deemed office? So if we look over here, uh, I ha would have to go back to see particularly with the two newer construction, the actual breakdown between 
how much of it is commercial and how much of it is well, community they facility. Well, they can't exceed two FAR if they were built under the existing zoning, yeah, they, right? So, so they're not a let's problem. So right? Let's assume they're fine. That those they're are the legal. two. But all the other build, with the exception of one smaller building, um, all of the buildings exceed two FAR of commercial. So as you can see here, the proposed development site is at 2.75. Some of the other buildings are uh, mostly along 8th Avenue or 2.06, and another one is 2.63. Thank you. Okay, and the final question, why was the selected district deemed to, to provide the greatest public benefit as opposed to districts that require absolute height limits and or mandate the inclusion of affordable housing? So there are two ways when we rezone a property to look at public benefit. And one, the one that we've seen most recently in the city is rezoning to include mandatory inclusionary housing. And while and I and other attorneys from my office have been here many times to talk about the public benefit of inclusionary housing, it is the department position of the city, Department of City Planning as a legal matter that the only time where it is legally permissible to introduce a mandatory inclusionary housing requirement comes when there is such a substantial increase in the residential bulk so as to outpace the inclusionary requirement. And I believe that the, most, the latest guidance has that as approximately a 40% increase in the permitted residential floor area. And that is more bulk than we need to introduce as part of this application to achieve the goal of bringing the existing built form into, into compliance. The other public benefit in these rezonings is the provision of community facility space because community facilities are a special place in zoning because they provide resources to communities that commercial spaces don't. And they service the people who live and work in the area by providing things like doctor's offices, nonprofit facilities, and other community benefits. And we think the provision of the C42 district actually increases that aspect of the community benefit by preserving the 4.8 FAR of allowable community facility. Any contextual zoning district that we'd bring in that would keep bulk at a similar scale to what is already permissible in the area would eliminate community, available community facility space from 4.8 FAR to approximately 3 FAR. And that would actually decrease the public benefit. So by proposing the non-contextual district, we're actually increasing the public benefit by, even though there's no inclusionary housing, preserving community facility space. So if you could get back to us with a particular district to do explicit research on, uh, for example, C6, C2-6, and I believe mm -hmm. there's an A version of that, um, which would have a 4 FAR for community facility, which would have 4.6 for residential pursuant to MIH, would have 2 mm -hmm. FAR on commercial. So if you might mm -hmm. look if that district were applied, how would it affect all the seven properties you get back to us in that? Yeah, we're absolutely happy to, though I'd also note here that the 2 FAR of commercial and four FAR permitted community facility would render most of the buildings in the proposed rezoning areas non-compliant. Because most of them are over the two FAR of commercial floor area or over the four FAR with community facility. All right, so if you could detail that for mm -hmm. us, that'd be great. Absolutely, thank you. That concludes our questions, thank you very much. Is there anyone else that would like to speak that has not submitted a speaker slip? Okay, hearing none, Richard, would you please close this item? Calendar item number six is closed. Calendar item number seven, one nine zero three seven nine ZSK. This application submitted by 1247 MNF Management pursuant to sections 197-C and 200 of the New York City Charter for the grant of a special permit to reduce the required distance from the edge of an accessory, accessory outdoor swimming pool to a zoning lot line in connection with the 10-story mixed-use residential building yeah, at 1247 I think so. Atlantic Avenue in Brooklyn Community District 3. Such action would legalize an outdoor swimming pool constructed as an accessory use to the residence, residence of 1247 Atlantic Avenue. Community Board 3 voted to approve this application on June 24, 2019. With Yiddle Firth, the representative for this application, please state your name for the record and present the application. Hi, actually, uh, my name is Alexander Blakely. I'm the architect for, for that applicant, Yidil Firth, um, to speak about uh, our request here. 
Um, so the building um, in question here is at 1247 Atlantic Avenue. Um, we are seeking to, first of all, introduce you to um, the pool that we're proposing in the backyard of, of that building and then um, and tell you why that we, th we think it won't be a visual or acoustical um, detriment to, to the area, the surrounding. Uh, specifically, we're seeking to have, uh, to have approved a pool within or under 50 feet distance to the property line um, under a mechanism in the zoning resolution uh, it was section 7486. So, um, 1247 Atlantic Avenue is a otherwise, as of right, 10-story <clears throat> mixed-use building um, for which in a second amendment we had a swimming pool in the backyard approved, um, unbeknownst to us that we had to have special approval by, the, by city planning for, for it to be within 50 feet of the property line. Um, the subject property is located in a C45D zoning district, uh, approximately 70 feet from Nostrand Avenue. We're surrounded on the west and the east sides by manufacturing districts, um, commercial districts um, to the south and to the north, and there is an R6B district zoned adjacent to the northern portion of our property. There are actually only two uh, residential buildings um, that are residential on the ground floor butting up to our property in that R6B district. Uh, from this plan, you can see the rear portion of the property, uh, the northern portion of the property is approximately 68 feet by 20 feet, 25 feet wide. Um, the pool itself is 15 by 35 feet in its dimensions. Um, there is an in-ground spa to the northernly most portion of that um, property. Again, both of these were approved by the building department, um, unbeknownst to the examiner and to us that it needed special approval by the, the planning commission. And uh, just as, as an aside, this pool has also been approved by the Department of Health. This is showing you the position of the building in respect to the intersection at Nostrin Avenue and Atlantic Avenue. The pool is in the rear yard with, with no access. There's no access from the street to that portion of, of the yard. Uh, this is an image showing a, the exact dimensions of that pool in the rear yard. And this, the, rear, the, the, the pool is enclosed in an eight foot steel post and wood plank fence with a acoustical lining within it and I understand that it's of particular concern um, the uh, the potential acoustical uh, disruption that it might cause in the neighborhood and uh, again we're here to to tell you why it won't be one is the pool will be only in use from uh, late June to early September from the hours of 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. There will be strict rules posted in the pool area as to uh, you know, the volume at, one, at, at which one can speak and um, who can be there, or kids can't be there unattended with, without parents. Uh, there will be a site super on the site at all times to make sure that these rules are adhered to. Um, I'm gonna show you in the next slide a section um, which shows that there's actually a, a drop in elevation uh, in grade to the adjacent properties that are residentially zoned so that effectively that, that fence is actually about 20 feet high from, from that perspective. Uh, it should be mentioned also that um, it's a, a particular interest uh, to us that safety of those using the pool is maintained with a six-foot-high security fence, 
which will only be accept accessible to residents of the building. It's um, the, the, the actual pool will only accommodate uh, residents of the building. It's not open to the general public. It will be also closed during the hours when it's not being used. You won't be able to access it and it will be covered, the pool. These are just um, two images, one looking from above from the perspective of uh, looking north. And the other one is also looking north at eye level, showing this eight foot high fence which surrounds the pool and this um, semi-transparent six foot fence for security. Again, we're seeking permission um, as per section 7486 of the zoning resolution to legalize what, um, what is actually now um, is 90% built the pool because we didn't receive objection to the pool um, an, uh, until another filing after that, amend, uh, that amendment that we filed in uh, March of 2018. So it, I want to stress that we, uh, that the client or the owner of the property did not know that we needed special permission and I did not know either. Not. And so, so, so just simply, uh, based on the section of the special permit, what findings does the, do the commissioners need to make at the City Planning Commission to allow the reduction below 50? Um, uh, the findings are that, uh, that you, uh, we must prove that it's sufficiently buffered, I think is the word that's used visually and acoustically from, you know, causing a, a, a causing a disruption in, in the neighborhood or to the character of the neighborhood. I think that's fine. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Is there anyone who would like to speak who hasn't submitted a speaker slip? Okay, hearing none, Richard, would you please close this item? Calendar item number seven is closed. The hearing on these items is now closed. Thank you for participating in this public hearing. Borough President Adams will review the applications we heard today and will soon submit his recommendations to the City Planning Commission. Borough President Adams would like to take this opportunity to remind you that the City Planning Commission will hold a public hearing on these items. The hearing is now adjourned. Borough President Adams would like to remind those viewing on the website that timely comments can be submitted by email to askeric at brooklynbp.nyc.gov. Thank you.